Hi, Deborah Davitt of Etta Earth here. Um, nice to meet all of you. I apologize in advance, I'm not particularly used to doing the whole video thing, and I am probably not the most scintillating personality you have ever seen on YouTube. Now, the questions I have been getting about a four-year-old book are about pronunciation, and that's a longer subject than you would think it is. So we're going to just start with a very basic question, which is one I got in the early days, which is, if you were portaled into Edda Earth through some dimensional fold, would you be able to understand the languages being spoken? And the short answer is no, probably not. And there are reasons for this. You might recognize some cognates. There are some words that haven't particularly changed that much over time, but languages evolve. Okay, our English that we know it today has a history. It does not necessarily start with just the geography of England, which was an isolated island in the North Atlantic, um, and still is. Uh, sometimes they like to be a little bit further away from Europe than, than other times. Sometimes they're a little closer to Europe. Sometimes they're a little further away from Europe, at least mentally, right? So at the time of the Roman conquest of England, it was not England, it was Albion or Britannia or whatever you want to call it at that point in time. The natives all spoke Brythonic or a variety of different dialects of a essentially, what we'll call it Gaelic uh, language group because that's easier. Um, they therefore then imposed Latin on the populace, at least in terms of if you want to talk about, if you want to talk to your landlord, you have to be able to speak a little bit of Latin. If you want to, you know, pay your taxes, you have to speak a little bit of Latin. If you want to deal with, you know, all these crazy new ideas and things that are coming in, like uh, irrigation and sewage and things like that, you need to know a little Latin. Okay, fine, cool. But eventually Rome had to withdraw from the island. And at that point in time, you have a population that speaks basically a Gaelic root language with some Latin imposed over the top of it. And that is when invaders came in. So you have the Anglos and the Saxons coming in from the continent, the continental languages that they spoke, which were what we now would consider Anglo-Saxon, but it, they were a Germanic root language one of the very, very, very many, and they came in and they conquered large portions of the island, which pushed a lot of the Gaelic-speaking people off to the fringes, Cornish, Welsh, Irish, what we would consider today to be Scots, Scottish, Scottish Gaelic, moved up. Everybody got kind of pushed to the margins, to the periphery, because we got invaders. And the people who spoke Anglo-Saxon might have sounded a little bit like this. What? We yardena and yardenum, fjord kinninger, thrimgefrunen, huda etelinges, elen fremedon. Of chil chafing, shethena threatum, monagam megthum, meld settler of tea, exora eoles, sith and erest worth. Fear shift gefunden, head as frofer gebed, wex and awokenem, wherefrenem tha, oth that him eg wilk yibsindra, of a fra, of a rondrada, here and shoulder gomben gildin, that was good kinning. That's the opening of Beowulf, with a little stammering and stuttering on my part, because it's been 20-some years since I studied this. So that's the opening few lines of Beowulf. So there's that. When people initially asked me, what did Sigrun sound like when she speaks? She might sound somewhat like that. If you're going to go for the... Anglo-Saxon origin, the, Ang the old Norse origin sounding language that I use throughout Edda to represent the Gothic languages. 
the great vowel my the great vowel shift has not occurred in this therefore all of the the, the vowel sounds are that of continental languages they there, there, there are very few words here that sound like modern English, but when I said that was good kinning, you could probably hear, like somebody has a heavy accent, they might be saying, that was a good king, because that's pretty much exactly what I just said. That was good kinning. Good king. All right, so there's that. Now, over time and over conquest, 1066 comes along and the Normans with Norman French, which was a Latin based language that was imp Latin was imposed heavily on the Gauls who spoke largely a Gaelic language. Um, but they were closer to the heart of the, of the, of the Roman empire. And therefore they spoke a more Latin intensive language there. And then it degenerated into medieval French as you know, Rome fell. And so then they have medieval French and then they come in 1066, William, the conqueror comes in, beats King Harold at the battle of Hastings. We all know this from history. And so you've got medieval French, which is late Latin, late Latin medieval French sitting like a hat on top of what is an Anglo-Saxon Germanic based language, which I just read to you. A couple of hundred years go by. People need to talk to their landlords. People need to pay their taxes. People want to write poetry. And slowly the language becomes what we call a Creole, which is when two languages love each other very much, but don't want to get married. But then they, they lived in sin for so long that they may as well. So that's what we get in Middle English. And that is the language of Chaucer. And as I skim on through this, see if I can find the, the opening that I would love to read for you here. Here we go. One that April with a sure sorter, the draught of merch has passed to the rota, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur, of which virtue engendereth is the flour. One zephyr is ache with his sweeter breath, and spirit hath, ere in every holt and heath, the tender croppers, and the young song, hath in the ram, hath his horse your own, and the small fowl is making melodia, that sleep in all the neat open with open e. So pricketh him nature in his courages, then folk long and gone on pilgrimages, and palmeras for to seek in strangest strandes, to fair na halways, coth in sundry lands, and specially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury they wend, the holy blissful martyr for to seek, that him hath hope and one they were to seek. Again, it's been 20 years, Other fully trained linguists may not like how I read that, but that's pretty much the way Geoffrey Chaucer would have sounded, or Geoffrey Chaucer, or however you want to say it. Um, the vowel change. All of English vowels went up a pitch to become what we now have in modern English. So all vowels are tones. We started off with having continental Germanic vowels for a lot of different reasons that linguists like to argue about and can't prove. Our vowels all went up one tone. Then you have our migration from England to North America, and then American English is actually archaic in many regards. Uh, we preserve an accent that would have been more common at the point in time of the of, of the migration, which is why Appalachian English is thought to preserve a lot of the original sound of English at the time of the immigration. Um, and then obviously we developed in isolation. That's how our English developed. Sigrun's language is a completely different story. Now, there was still linguistic isolation because in Edda, the more obstreperous Gothic tribes got invited to leave their homelands because you're getting on the Romans' nerves 
and we could genocide you, but it would probably be better for everyone if we just point you across this ocean over here where some of your people found a way across and there's this whole great big continent that's, we're told, very sparsely populated, only it's not sparsely populated at all. The, uh, the I'm pretty sure the Iroquois didn't really enjoy the in incursions, but that's a period of Edda's history that I haven't really developed. But you have this language group coming over, parking in Caesarea Aquilonis, North America, and they're developing in isolation just as our English, our American English did. And, but they have much more influence from the native languages. They have an overlay of Latin from the immediate source of Latin, not the intermediate source of medieval French. And they also have other tribes of obstreperous Gauls being sent to the southern reaches of Caesarea Aquilonis. So they have a Latin imposition, they have a Gaelic imposition, they have an interaction with Iroquois and all, all the other languages of North America. And now, I could have been all James Joyce or Tolkien, and I could have developed this language out and written an entire novel in that language, and then I probably would have gone and shot myself because nobody else would be able to read it, and it would have been a lot of work that would have been utterly wasted. Um, so the question becomes, how do you pronounce all this stuff, Deborah? And the answer is, it. I'm not sure it matters. In terms of linguistics, anything that comes from a dead language, how you pronounce it is largely a matter of conjecture. So how do you pronounce things? Sigrun Keisha, Trenis Matrugena, Kanmi Esmunajar, Adam Ben Maur, Minori Sasaki, Propraetor Antonius Valerius Livoris. Whenever you see the letters D A E G for day, it would be Dai or Dai. So Monan Dai, Tiwas Dai, Wodens Dai, Thunus Dai, Frege Dai, Saturnus Dai, Sunana Dai. Just for example, the, the G becomes silent in, at the end like that. At least that's how I was taught. Um, let's see what else we got here. I'm looking for my glossary here. Here we go. Just going from the top of the of the of the glossary and only hitting the Gothic terms. Athales ides, Athelinga, Atheling, E Lagol, Quelluwerm. Forferen, forferest, ficken, fickestu, very naughty. Yea, again the G becomes sort of the the glide vowel, the glide vowel there of a yea. Instead of yea, like in modern English. Um thusar, hrim thusar, hedethunger, enanverm. Now it's the fact that I do verm as opposed to worm. Uh, nith, nithing, nithogger, Jormagundr, for you would see it on the page, it looks like Jormagand or Jormagand, it's Jormagundr, um, Ritare scale, Sather, uh, for, for magic, Sather, uh, and don't ask me about the Gaelic, the, the Gaelic is its own thing, it behaves by its own rules and I don't know those rules and they scare me. So there's that. That's about all I have. Happy holidays and there are lots and lots of resources out there online for Old Norse, Anglo-Saxon and there's plenty of things that will probably tell you that I was wrong. But then again we're talking about Edda where language has changed and evolved over time in different and wild and crazy ways than from our own. So 
Happy holidays. Bye-bye.